when we speak of budgets which have been held over the years, there have been numerous budget promises over the years. Do they get fulfilled? Most of the time they don't. Now, if you go back and look at the last so many years, what we see consistently is that money has really not been allocated for these things. Right? So therefore, they don't actually get done. Recently, Nishan Dimel's outfit, Verite, had done some sort of looking back evaluations and uh, Verite shows that some 90% of the promises have not been met. As it now stands, we certainly don't have any money left over after we sort of spend on essentials. Just to give you a, a, just one example of every rupee that we bring in as revenue to the government in taxes, even next year, 65 cents will go to pay interest only. Salaries will take another, pensions and salaries will take another 50%. We have really no money left to do anything, right? So whatever these promises are, will have to be fulfilled by borrowing. Right? That's number one. And uh, number two is, uh, will there be actual allocations for these things? So the answer to your question is really not, 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 you know, won't get done. Welcome everyone to another episode of Conversations with Alanki. Now these programs are not just your regular interviews, but rather conversations that I have with the right people on the right topics that shape our everyday lives. Today, the focus of the conversation would be on the budget for 2024. And I feel I got the right person uh, to have this conversation with. He needs no special introduction. It's Member of Parliament, Dr. Harsha De Silva. Welcome. Thank you, Alanki. Thank you so much. This is my second conversation with you, although it's been, uh, there's been a gap of three years, I believe. Yeah. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. You? I'm doing good. Um, first, uh, let's talk about the 2024 budget. Do you think it provides essential relief to those who are really burdened? Well, I mean, let's look at the context in which the president as the Minister of Finance has had to present this budget. You see, he, uh, with all due respect for, uh, you see, what he has presented, uh, it does not necessarily answer your question, meaning relieve the, the, you know, the pains that the people are going through. And I'm not holding him responsible for it. Uh, I'll just give you a, a number. You know, he said, uh, look, you know, inflation is 2%. There are no uh, fuel queues. You know, you call and the gas tank will be delivered to your house and all that. That's true. So that's a new equilibrium. What I mean is things are stable, right? But that is a different level of equilibrium. Right. Now, previously, uh, you know, let's go back to 2021. Uh, a family of four needed about something like 89,000 rupees to survive a month. When I say survive, that was the average cost uh, to, to sort of um, uh, more than to make ends meet, but general cost of uh, living for four. Now that has gone up to 100 and almost 80,000 rupees in this new equilibrium, which means prices have or cost of living has almost doubled. Right now, the question then is: Will a ten thousand rupee increase in public mm -hmm. sector salaries do? You know, is that sufficient? Now, there's a whole host of new taxes that are also going to come. So while um, you know, I told in my sort of uh, reply speech: Look, you know, don't self-congratulate yourself uh, for having uh, you know presented what you think is an excellent budget. You know, there may be some, you know, expectations, but to what um, level of satisfaction those can be met is a, a different question altogether. And 
when we speak of budgets which have been held um, over the years, there have been numerous budget promises over the years. But do they get fulfilled? Most of the time they don't. You see, I mean, there are two things. Budget promises are the ones that uh, Minister of Finance sort of, you know, uh, announces during his speech. Mm -hmm. And usually what happens is the government will, you know, bang their, you know, fists on the table, make noise, you know, you know, sort of uh, appreciate the announcement by the, the minister. Usually these, uh, you know, deal with increasing salaries, you know, reducing some expenditure somewhere or saying I'll do this, that, we probably can get to it. For instance, saying I will give 50,000, you know, uh, free houses, etc. Now, if you go back and look at the last so many years, what we see consistently is that money has really not been allocated for these things. Right? So therefore, they don't actually get done. Recently, Nishan Dimel's outfit, Verite, had done some uh, uh, sort of looking back evaluations and uh, Verite shows that some 90% of the promises uh -huh. uh, have not been met. Now, now, make note of what I just said, and that is not all of what is in the budget. Those are the new promises, new proposals that are announced in the budget speech because as it now stands we certainly don't have any money left over after we uh, sort of spend on essentials just to give you a, a just one example of every rupee that we bring in as revenue to the government in taxes even next year 65 cents will go to pay Interest only, just purely interest, you know. Salaries will take another, pensions and salaries will take another 50%. We have really no money left to do anything, right? So whatever these promises are, will have to be fulfilled by borrowing. Right? That's number one. And uh, number two is, uh, will there be actual allocations for these things? So the answer to your question is uh, really not 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 you know won't get done so what are your views i mean does do you think this budget i mean if implemented would bring about economic recovery or is it merely designed for the elections well i mean i will give credit to the president in that he is trying to realign the economic model right sri lanka was going downhill mm -hmm. and that is because since 94 change politically uh, the direction has been ideologically incorrect in my view uh, for instance if you look at revenue raising right which is the main objective of a particular budget for the coming 12 months uh, during Mr. Premadas's time, you know, just before he was killed at that time and sort of the momentum going forward, uh, the government collected about 20-21% of GDP as tax or revenue, tax and non-tax revenue. Now, with 20-22%, he did many things. He had Janasavya, he had midday meals, he had school uniforms, you know, he helped the poor, he built houses. How did he do that? Because he had that money. Now, since 94, that kept dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And, you know, before we entered into this IMF agreement, it was something like 8%. So there's no money to do anything. So point number one is there has been no conscious effort to ensure that the government had enough money to provide for the people. I mean, if you're trying to create a, a social democracy, you'll have to have money to spend on education, on health, etc. Just to give you a number, 
the benchmark for education and health is about 4 to 5 percent of GDP, uh-huh. right? Minimum. But we spend about one and a half, 1.7 percent of GDP. So certainly that is not enough. Kids don't have proper schools. You saw what happened in a Columbus school where infrastructure is so bad, a little six-year-old baby girl, you know, died because mm-hmm. something fell on her head. Right? There are no computers, there are no teachers, there are no labs, right? So it is a complete mess. So there is no money. We have to spend a lot more money on education and in health. But we don't, right? So that's one issue. The second issue, I'll give you another example, is that was a time Sri Lanka was really linking up with the world, you know, uh, sort of uh, um, during his time, he was president, Mr. Vikram Singh, a current president, was a minister of, minister of industries. So it was a Premadasa Vikram Singh uh, uh, ideology, really, uh, that got these 200 apparel factories, uh, you know, uh, established uh, across the country. Right? And with that, we started becoming a, 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 a real player in global apparel sourcing. Right? That was a different regime. There were quota systems and all that. But by 95, both Sri Lanka and Vietnam exported $3.5 billion to the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. But after 94, what happened was while Vietnam went from apparels to shoes, to toys, to radios, to TVs, to electronics, to telephones, to defense equipment, etc. The ideology since 94 didn't encourage exports. It was looking inwards, you know, let's do some, you know, home gardening, you know, you know, do something in your village, you know, that kind of thing, you know, let us, you know, build, you know, very high tariff barriers so that you are protected from competition from the rest of the world. Uh, So you look inwards and let the state get involved a lot more than before, right? So by 2022, Sri Lanka exported $12.5 billion, right? And we had moved beyond apparels. Vietnam had exported $336 billion. So you see how the ideological change since 94 totally destroyed the 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 trajectory this country was taking so in that context now that we are bankrupt the only asian country to uh, declare bankruptcy uh, for the last 50 years the president is saying look this model is wrong we have to go back to a uh, Javadana Premadasa ideology. We have to integrate this country to the, the rest of the world, which is what people like us have been saying for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. Mm-hmm. You know, we wrote a blueprint for our political party and, uh, you know, two versions of it have been tabled in parliament. That, that is where we ought to go. So I cannot fault with the president for, uh, you know, trying to turn the ship around from a state is inward looking, you know, you know, bound by so many restrictions and bureaucracies and and overarching inward looking state is political ideology to one that is open and dynamic, right? So in that context, I see this going in that direction, but I have massive problems in terms of his ability uh, to actually implement any of these ideas, particularly because he doesn't have a mandate. And and the other main reason is in my budget speech, I talked about uh, an oxymoron of a government, meaning it's contradictory. There is an internal contradiction in the system where the poor to a folk who are supporting him just for political expediency, I doubt very much uh, are aligned uh, with the open, dynamic, entrepreneurial-led model, right? So therefore, I see uh, this as a mere 
statement of fact and objective, uh, but stops there. Uh, Dr. Harsha, like you mentioned, since, uh, I mean, for over 20 years now, um, there's been this, I mean, they've been looking inwards. Sri Lanka has been yeah. looking inwards uh, for solutions. Uh, but if you had to reflect back um, on the Yahapalne government, what did the government back then do to strengthen the economy? And did they foresee the economic crisis? Yeah, I mean, 2015-19 was actually a missed opportunity, right? A lot of people had a lot of hope. You know, we worked very hard to bring Sirisena, uh, Vikramasinghe uh, government, uh, you know, to be one that would resolve problems. You know, the start was very good. You know, we got the uh, constitutional amendment done. And, uh, you know, we tried to resolve the, uh, the problems we had with the rest of the world. We managed to resolve the Geneva matter to quite an extent. Mm -hmm. uh, we were making progress in reconciliation. Uh, but uh, soon that fell apart, right? Because um, politics got in the way. Uh, and uh, the cabinet was divided. I was never in cabinet. People like us were never given an opportunity to work in that government, you know. Uh, but that's a personal matter. But uh, the divergence really uh, made it a um, sort of, a, you know, lame duck, uh, you know, uh, administration uh, for most of its time. Because on the one hand, while one group was trying to integrate and liberalize, the other group was trying to keep to the same, you know, since 94 uh, till 2015 ideology intact. Mm -hmm. For instance, just one example is the, the signing of the Singapore Free Trade Agreement. Right? After it was done, uh, the president said, uh, you know, withdraw it. You know, another uh, was the, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it was told that, look, this is uh, for the Americans to take over Sri Lanka to build a wall from Colombo to Trincomalee and so on. It's all absolute, total lie. But, you know, that was the anti-integration line, you see? Uh, so, whatever they tried to do was blocked because of ideological friction. And, um, and um, so, therefore, uh, that didn't happen, you know. And uh, corruption allegations that, uh, you know, tarnished the administration, you know, fairly uh, early on in the, the administration was not helpful. So even though there was an attempt, um, it, it was uh, it was it, it was um, a false hope, uh, you know. At the end of the day. And when you talk about corruption, um, um, let's talk a little bit about the bond scam. Is it really a scam? Because I am the reason I'm asking you this question is because different people have different views, and and I feel like there's a lot of misinformation out there. Yeah, I mean, in in Parliament, there are maybe only a few, uh, Iran, myself included, who really have worked at senior positions in banks, right? I was a treasurer of a large bank. I know what bond trading is about. Uh, I know how inside information can uh, lead towards unjust enrichment by certain people. Mm -hmm. We had seen this in the stock market uh, during the 2011-12 period. You know, I raised my voice then. Uh, subsequently, an analysis or a commission that was appointed by the president has an entire volume of how insider information through the central bank uh, and certain identified stockbrokers help certain individuals make billions of rupees. It is the same thing in the bond market, right? 
certain individuals made billions by utilizing information that was not available to the others, which is called insider trading. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Raj Raj Ratnam of, you know, uh, you know, Sri Lankan origin in, in New York, you know, famous case where he was jailed in America for, I think, like nine or 12 years for inside information, right? Now, so the it is quite clear that there was uh, uh, a scam. Mm -hmm. There was, right? Now, the issue is because people didn't understand what this was. People hadn't even heard the word bond, actually. Forget about you know, how to price a bond, what is a black shows theory, you know, what is a, a, a bond trading at a discount versus bond trading at a premium. Even the Auditor General's department didn't really understand the nuances of how to trade these bonds. So therefore, this was just like a, you know, uh, you know, a term, a word that people used mm. without really uh, understanding, like I said, to just, you know, blame everybody, you know, uh, bond scam, bond scam, bond scam. Even, you know, grandmothers in, uh, you know, way of candy, you know, somebody told me, came and said, ah, bond scam. <laughs> so, so, so this is what I'm saying. Our people, uh, you know, are very quick to point fingers right. uh, and there is hardly any opportunity for a analytical sort of, you know, breakdown of how things are done, you know, who did what and who didn't. Um, so, so while I agree, there were certain people who certainly seem to have benefited, uh, the label kind of got stuck on people who had really nothing to do with it. I mean, if it, if it is a scam, why hasn't anyone been held accountable? Uh, that's the issue. That's really the issue, right? That's really the issue, right? I mean, that is why people are upset and angry, right? Why aren't wrongdoers punished? Right. Whether it is that or... Let's look at the sugar scam. Sugar mm -hmm. scam is much bigger than the, the bond scam. Right. Then the sugar scam has happened for the second time. Right. What about the drug scam? Right. What about all the COVID antigen scam? What about all the, 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 the there is some garlic scam. Right. There is some pepper scam. You know, if you look at all these, these are huge, but no one, no one, no one has been uh, sort of, you know, tried, convicted and sent to jail. Right? I mean, what is, what is even worse is there are folks who are, have been convicted, who are sitting in parliament and arguing uh, um, as members of the cabinet. Convicted. Right? So, so this is a problem. And... And, you know, you see, uh, you, know, the, you know, you can't eliminate corruption voluntarily. People are not going to do that, right? One is transparency. The other one is a strong political will to pursue these cases and throw these uh, crooked elements uh, in jail and throw away the key. Mm -hmm. You know, unless you do that. Uh, you know, you will continue to ask me this question. Um, indeed, because I, I think for as long as uh, people have lost faith in the system, people have lost faith in most politicians and in most political parties simply for the reason, the, simply the reason being that so much wrong is happening and, and there are so many injustices, so much corruption, but no one is being held accountable at the end of the day. What what would the SJP do differently to tackle corruption? Good question. I mean, we have written a blueprint one and two, and we have brought erasing corruption as the first uh, thing that our government uh, will do. Because that, I think, is what is called a necessary condition. For Sri Lanka to get out of this hole we are in and, you know, create that country that, young people's dreams can materialize 
and they would not want to run away but want to stay mm -hmm. here is going to take a lot more than erasing corruption. You have to have a vision, you have to have a plan, you have to have a, a strategy, you have to have global connections, you have to be open to the ideology of connecting Sri Lanka to the world, right? Which is what people like us bring to the table. Now, on the corruption side, there is one uh, one key thing that we will we will change, and that is we will create an independent prosecution office, right? That is a state body, mm -hmm. but an independent body. Currently, what happens is the 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 AG's department is is under a a, a politically appointed individual, right? Actually, it used to be under the president during the Rajapaksa time. Now it is under the Minister of Justice. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the Minister of Justice. What I'm saying is, one day the 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 AG's department is working for the particular uh, politically uh, sort of appointed, uh, let's say, cabinet minister. Right, and he wants to do a procurement or whatever it is. You consult with the AGS department, and then you do it. And then the next day, he is accused uh, uh, for you know grand corruption, bribery, and you are supposed to sue him. You know what generally happens, and what we saw happening is how many cases got withdrawn. People are happy. Suddenly they say, "Look, we have filed charges against." Eight people. Well, nobody knows down the road all eight uh, charges have been withdrawn. So, therefore, you must have a politic, non political, independent office of prosecution for bribery and corruption matters, not for others. Mm -hmm. Particularly for bribery and corruption matters of officials, politicians, and business people. Right? Because all three, unless all three people collude, this won't happen. If the corruption, is, if only the politician is corrupt, there cannot be corruption. Because who's the other side? If only the official is corrupt, it still can't happen. Right. If only the, uh, the, the business person is corrupt, still it can't happen. So the, it is, a, it is a, a sort of a tragic, um, it is a toxic synthesis of these three corrupt entities. Not every business person, every official, every politician is corrupt. But those corrupt elements are the ones who create these things called rogue rings that continue to steal and pilfer uh, public money. So what SJB is going to do is to Make sure those prosecutions are seen to an end. Mm -hmm. Okay? If we can see 10 prosecutions seen to an end and 10 corrupt elements put in jail, I think that will be a good enough, uh, you know, uh, what do you call, um, um, uh, indication. Uh, for uh, corruption to be significantly reduced. The budget proposal provided that the collection of rent uh, from houses provided on interest basis to urban low-income families will be halted and ownership would be transferred um, to the occupants of these houses. Are we in a position to afford this? See, once again, this is an ideological issue. Mm -hmm. You see, there was and still continues to be with certain people that some people know better than other people. So, from an investment point of view, from a development point of view, that makes sense. And from an equity point of view, also it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, if I was in government, uh, I, would, I would do this. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, the issue is, did you allocate enough funds to do this? Mm -hmm. Now, that's the issue. Yes. Right. If you look at 50,000 homes, that's what he said. And let's say at the very minimum, 4 million rupees a home, uh, that is 200 billion. Right. Have you allocated 200 billion? No. 
right? I think the allocation is like some 15 billion. So what can you do with that money? So the question that you asked at the beginning, Alanki, whether these promises can be actually fulfilled. fulfilled, I see a massive problem here because the idea is right, but where is the money to do it? So who is going to pay the contractors who built these homes? Exactly. Or who is going to settle the bank loans that the UDA took to build these homes? Somebody has to pay. So when you say give free, there's nothing free. There's always a cost. Somebody has to bear the cost. Right? So who's going to bear the cost? Where is the money allocated? Good question, um, which is exactly why I asked you um, if this was something we can afford right now, given that we are facing a severe economic crisis. Um, before we move on uh, to the final question, I'd like to know, Dr. Harsha, what is the impact of increasing VAT? How does this, I mean, how does this uh, impact citizens and to what extent exactly? I mean, taxes are very high, uh -huh. you know, pay tax, VAT, social security levy, you know, excise tax, everything. Now, what has happened is the amount of tax collection is less than expected. So, therefore, we have to enhance the taxes. So, that is why new taxes have been introduced. So, the VAT, what is going to happen is going to be applied on almost everything. Mm -hmm. For instance, currently there is no VAT on petrol and diesel and LP gas. VAT will be introduced uh, onto these products. But petrol and diesel now carry what's called a PAL, that is a port and aviation levy, which will be taken out. So 18% will be slapped on it, about 8% will be taken out, so there is going to be an increase of about 10%. Mm -hmm. Then let's take, for instance, telephones, computers, 18% VAT. Let's take this electronic equipment, these cameras, 18% VAT. Let's take these lights, 18% VAT. Uh, let's take even medical equipment, 18% VAT. Let's take books and periodicals, 18% VAT. Let's take cars and trucks and, you know, uh, construction equipment, 18% VAT. So there is going to be a big impact, mm -hmm. right? And also, now the VAT threshold is 80 million rupees a year. That means unless you sell 80 million worth of product, you will not be liable to VAT. But it's going to come down to 60 million. Then there is a turnover tax, which is not VAT, meaning there is no uh, way to recoup what you pay, right? Uh, and that is called the social security levy, which is the, the threshold is 120 million, meaning unless you 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 sell two million worth of product a month, you are not liable. Now it comes down to one million rupees of product or one million rupees of product or services uh, to be liable. So more people are going to get in, included in that. Whereas there is no capital gains, new capital gains tax that was introduced. So this VAT, like you said is going to have an impact on everyone, mm -hmm. right? Whereas the focus should have really been on those who can afford. So, so, so yes, the answer to that question is a definite yes. So what you're saying is it, it should have been implemented in such a way so that it should have been for the ones who could afford it. Yeah, and also the big issue, Alanki, is that people are not paying no. Yes. People must pay the tax, but I did a uh, complete analysis and showed that the 100 billion rupees in taxes they're expecting from payee can be collected at a 24% highest marginal tax as opposed to a 36% highest marginal tax. I have proved it. I had given every piece of that equation to the government. They didn't even respond, right? But I'll tell you in our government next year, uh, I am hoping that we'll be able to bring down the marginal max uh, tax rate on pay to 24% because it can be done. All right. Moving on to the final question. Um, do you think we are on the right track now? You see, it's like this. Um, it is very, 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 very difficult for us to get out of this hole. 
you know unfortunately uh, gotabe rajapaksa who has been found guilty of economic crimes basically mm-hmm. and his brothers and uh, the other people jasundara khabra lakshman uh, kumar singh etc uh took this country back 9 years okay 9 years 9 years we are back to something like 2013 2014 not even 2014 2013 that's where we are at a much higher level of poverty poverty doubled rohan samarvi ji was uh, numbers show learners and numbers show poverty went from 3 million to 7 million world bank said poverty went from uh, 12.5% to 25% undp oxford looked at what is called a multi dimensional uh, poverty which includes beyond uh, 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 sort of uh, economic factors like income education and health and that they say 57% of sri lankan people are multi dimensionally vulnerable uh, or poor so we are in a big mess salanki right so how do we get out of this so so uh, no, no, rani vikrama singh the president said by 2048 we can be a rich country to do that we have to grow every year about 6.4 6.5% year on year on year on year on year okay if you want to get to a rich country by 2038 we have to grow by about 12.5% year on year mm-hmm. but sri lanka has never grown at more than like 3 4% this year we are negative last year we were negative next year we are 1.4 you know we grew up 6.4 beyond that only a few years in a last 20 years or 30 years so in order for us to grow you have to be single mindedly uh you know targeting export led uh, global integrated growth that's the only place we are going to see this growth right so whether we are going to be on the right track or not is a question that will be answered at the next political change by the people and my message to the people is that let us not get fooled again right because these sweet things that you hear are untrue gotabe rajapaksa promised something called what prosperity and glory or nonsense right what was the there was a tag line or some, some something he said right where did we end up he promised us prosperity and glorious something we went bankrupt now some people are saying no no don't listen to harsh and others they are talking nonsense we know how to do it you don't have to go to the imf there needs not to be reform mm-hmm. you know we can do this by you know grouping people in uh, you know villages and all that <laughs> finished right so whether we are going to ever you know reach a minimum of 6.5% growth for the next 25 years and become a developed country by the time we are 100 years old depends on whether people are willing to sacrifice i i'm sorry but you know i'm always i always try to tell the truth here right mm-hmm. and you know be disciplined you know have good governance uh, and you know be civic minded pay your taxes and and proceed so otherwise i think uh, we'll all have to find uh, some other passport then and and like everyone else you know get out of here um i've heard um this famous quote which says uh, that when it comes to the political leaders you um you elect uh, it reflects um it reflects people it reflects the people who vote for them uh, it reflects society uh, so therefore uh, i do think like dr harsha said it's very important to think uh twice uh, and to be wise and intelligent when making decisions thank you very much dr harsha for this conversation and for sharing your views and thoughts um we i'll be back with another episode until then stay safe and take care